بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome everybody to uh, this uh, very distinguished session uh, with our uh, world eminent speaker, uh, Professor Tariq Sharawi, uh, the very well-known figure in the glaucoma uh, specialty. And uh, today uh, he will uh, uh, teach us about how to deal with the conjunctival nightmares. Of course, uh, Professor Tariq Sharawi doesn't need to be introduced. He is well, very well known. And um, um, it's our pleasure to have, to have him in uh, Sinjab Academy Glaucoma Series. And actually I owe him for uh, arranging and organizing the uh, presentations of um, or the lectures and inviting a lot of speakers to be with us. Uh, of course, uh, I, I appreciate as well the efforts of Dr. Munir um, for the same. Uh, so the stage is yours, Dr. Tariq. Thank you very much, Dr. Mazen. Uh, it is always a pleasure to be uh, with you in anything that you organize. Uh, uh, you always stress on a very high standard of uh, education, and I, uh, I can uh, relate and believe in that. I'm also very happy that uh, Munir is with us. Uh, Munir is a brilliant, brilliant glaucoma surgeon. I have a lot of respect for him, and that we always have interesting discussions. <laughs> This comes in the uh, night of uh, El Eid, the Bayram, Eid Mubarak to all of you. Uh, may you um, enjoy uh, its blessings, enjoy your families, enjoy your children, enjoy the food, uh, as long as we do not overdo it. Uh, and with that, I will start my talk. Now, you know that we have a lot of glaucoma procedures that are available now, as you can see here. And you might remember that we discussed before that we have not changed significantly what we have been doing. Most surgeries are done where we do subconjunctival filtration. So we rely on the conjunctival. Some operations would be through the conventional pathway, ab or external or ab internal, and some would be supracoroidal. And those two types of surgeries are usually um, lab free so they are conjunctiva free or conjunctiva independent cyclodestruction is always an option but the majority of surgeries that are being done uh, around the world it, it relates to uh, doing subconjunctival filtration i wonder if these num if the numbers of uh, cases uh, subconjunctival is a majority in the united states i just see, i've seen a paper where 75% of all cases done in America now for glaucoma are mix. A lot of mix are lab independent. So it is interesting to see if, uh, if they still rely on conjunctival procedures or not, or, not, uh, or subconjunctival filtration. I would argue that anyhow, most of us around the world are still using subconjunctival filtration as the main way to reduce pressure. And that can be ab external or ab internal through a paracentesis or through, uh, 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 I mean, through a person, this is all through scleral tunneling into the antechamber. So if you look at subconjunctival filtration, where everything here depends on the conjunctiva, you can do an ab internal or ab external Zen implants. And from an ab external point of view, you have trabeculectomies with or without an express, you have shunt tubes and valves, non penetrating procedures, and the micro shunt uh, or the arrow, whatever you like to name it. All those are operations that are related to subconjunctival filtration. And uh, due to the fact that we're doing a lot of subconjunctival filtration, unfortunately, we can identify that a lot of complications happen because we are relying on this way of, of filtration. So if you compare relative complication rates by subspecialty, as has been reported, as a percentage at three years um, through different uh, subspecialties, you can see refractive is almost negligible uh, percentage of complications, cataracts, oculoplasty, retinal uh, procedures, and then you have glaucoma at 50%. And this is actually a self-reporting by uh, subspecialists in ophthalmology, which tells you how uh, sad the situation can be. But glaucoma surgery in any type of glaucoma surgery is a, a, a number of crucial steps that you have to, to, to follow and excel in and perf perfect every single step. From the point you take a stitch in the cornea 
till the point you close the conjunctiva. Every single step has to be done seriously, uh, perfectly, and with a lot of concentration and uh, with a surgeon fully in focus. So <coughs> best way to avoid conjunctival nightmares is first of all to choose eyes that are, have decent conjunctiva. Bad conjunctivas, unfortunately, can result in conjunctival nightmares. So first of all, make sure that your conjunctiva is healthy to be able to do a good operation to avoid um, to avoid complication. I see that we are joined now by Ahmad Mustafa, who is my brother and a very good and uh, very good and close friend of mine. Uh, and it's also an opportunity for me to tell Ahmad uh, Eid Mubarak. So now it is also important when you are doing um, procedures that are that relates to the conjunctiva to have a decent exposure of the globe. As you can see here, I have uh, used the speculum that I have designed many years ago with no financial interest in that. And you can see with that, I can attach uh, an 8O vicral, pull the globe down, and that will give me a significant area on which I can dissect my, um, dissect my, my flap and open the conjunctiva decently. When I open the conjunctiva, I do a very small snip first, and then I do a, de a, a very um, deliberate and focused hydro dissection to be able to, first of all, detach the conjunctiva and tenon from underlying sclera, but also it gives me immediately an information, some information about the quality of the uh, conjunctiva that you are handling. This is very different from a case like that where we are doing again hydro dissection, but you can see all this area of conjunctiva that has already died, unfortunately, and uh, scarred. So there's no point to dissect at this point of time. Deep screctomy, my preferred procedure, still relies very much on the conjunctiva. As you will see here, after dissecting and having a decent you know, filtration coming out into the subconjunctival space and the intrasclear space, we uh, augment the results of this operation, obviously with things that will affect the conjunctiva. Here is in a high risk cases, we're using 0.5 milligram per milliliter for three minutes. That's a, a strong bombardment of the conjunctiva. And I use also uh, sometimes a reticulated hyaluronic acid um, to put under the flap and over the flap and under the conjunctiva. All those things are done to try to manipulate the conjunctiva and the, the scarring, obviously. And when I close, I close with an 8O vicral knee with, an, with a round needle, never a speculated needle. And the way I close is not too complicated, as you can see. Uh, remember that you have to always, always water your conjunctiva. Watering the conjunctiva is like watering a plant. Uh, it will die, it will dry on you if you don't water it during the operation. So here you can see we are using the 8O and we are pulling very well the conjunctiva to stretch it completely, even causing a little bit of astigmatism on the cornea. I don't care because that will go away, but the most important thing is that I don't want to have a leak. And then I continue to suture the conjunctiva uh, continuously, as you can see. So sort of one line of an 8O vicle and the last stitch basically is closed in itself. So it is not a very complicated way to close. Uh, for those of you who um, follow other schools that actually uh, create corneal tunnels and they use 10O to close the conjunctiva on a on a, on the, with a corneal tunnel technique. This is not something that I like to do. And I have compared my results with this simple technique with um, very tight uh, and very elaborate closure on the cornea. And I didn't really see any difference in the potential for sidle post-operatively. But it is not always as easy as that. Look at this as we did a good operation and now we're trying to close and somehow conjunctiva is not coming. It retracted. You can do many things, but what I usually do is I will start this closing from back forward. 
Sometimes while you're doing that, you are pulling the, the conjunctiva as you advance. And this would allow you in some cases to be able to advance and close the conjunctiva. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't work. As you can see here, we tried and we still could not cover the, the, the area of filtration completely. So I go for an autologous flap that you can have a pedicle autologous flap or a free autologous flap. Uh, and you can get the autologous flap temporarily, nasally or inferiorly. There are many ways of doing that. But the, the trick is once you do this flap, you have to take your time, you have to take a, a big portion of your flap and you have to suture it very, very well to be able to make sure that it is absolutely compressing your flap area and that there's no, um, there's no leak. This is really, really important that you can see here, it's very well co-opted and we have a full anti-chamber and a decent pressure into the eye. Now, unfortunately, even if you do the operation very well, you are at the mercy of blebs. Blebs can come in different shapes and forms and blebs are, can be very treacherous. So it can bite you early on or late. This is a, a five weeks after a deep sclerectomy and you see the bleb now has ballooned uh, and it is becoming atrophic and avascular. And that is only five weeks after. So the only way that you can, you can manage that is actually to use uh, a needling. And then I use a, a, a closed needling, not a far needling. And I try to, uh, to dissect and cut all the posterior boundary of the flap of the two of the bleb to be able to get filtration posteriorly. And if you can see here, the end point has to be a bleb that is um, deflated and the bleb that uh, has filtration happening posteriorly. And you have to follow on or follow up those cases <clears throat> very uh, closely. This is a case uh, eight years down the line after the use of mitomycin and uh, developing a hypotony. And you can see uh, if you use fluorescein, you can see that the bleb is sweating, as you can see here. So filtration is happening through the wall of the bleb. And these are blebs that you should not accept. And you have to rework these blebs. Blebs that are prominent because of a very big bleb can be managed with a 10-0 compression sutures with a Palmberg sutures. That's what the, that's what uh, how Paul Palmberg has described it. And you can opt for autologous blood injection. Doesn't always, uh, you don't always need to do that. But if the bleb is really, really prominent and you want to give it a chance to scar a little bit, so it is not a bad idea to, to do an autologous graft. But the important thing is really a two mattress sutures of 10 uh, and nylon stitches that will, at the, at with time do a, some sort of a cheese wiring and penetrate the conjunctiva, creating a segmentation in the bleb, dividing it into smaller compartments and reducing the overall volume. This is one such case. And despite, this is the first post-operative day and the patient after having uh, those uh, stitches put in her, into her bleb, on the first post-operative day, most patients will tell you, we are feeling better. I don't know how they feel better after one day, but their, their comfort level increases with time, that's for sure. This is another bleb associated with a pressure of about nine. <clears throat> I suspect some sidal. And as you can see here, a little bit of sidal, but pressure, this does not cause a pressure of eight. So I continue, continue to rub the bleb while, while I'm thinking. Uh, and all of a sudden I find another uh, hole basically where you can see <clears throat> it was coming out in, in a waterfall. Uh, again, this is something that you should not accept. And for these cases, I would go uh, and excise the whole bleb because it's actually the whole big thing is totally uh, avascular, totally atrophic, and it is leaking in different places. This is not a, a, a case where I would um, cover or, uh, or partially correct. And then you can pull 
the conjunctiva and close or put a graft if you have to. This is another case you can see. Again, you have a bit of leakage here. It's not very massive. So I decide to do a, a, a hydro dissection and I see that there is only a small bit, as you can see here, of about one, one and a half millimeters of the roof of the bleft. So I decide instead of excising the whole bleb to just remove the roof, as you can see. Blunt dissection, patient dissection, we are removing the roof. Once the roof is removed, you have to create a new roof. And here is we are doing a sort of a purse string again with a round 8-0. 8-0 round needles are some of my best friends. And you can see we are advancing meticulously, really, really making sure that we are not going to uh, give any chance for this bleb to, uh, to leak. And we are closing it from both sides. Interestingly, those blebs, if you actually use strong amounts of mitomycin and you correct the bleb, in many cases, after a year or so, you will find the new bleb not leaking, functioning, but you will find it a bit avascular and uh, a bit atrophic, which is incredible. I mean, I, I really cannot imagine what kind of uh, effect the mitomycin does so that the bleb even a second bleb becomes atrophic and becomes a bit avascular. And I've seen that over and over and over again. Now, putting a tube, in some cases, three millimeters from the, from the limbus, you can find the tube coming out, very nasty complication. And for that, I have described this technique where we do a big flap, as you can see, which is nine or 10, sometimes 11 by seven or eight. And we do this huge flap. And through that, we do a deep scleral dissection. And the idea of doing the deep scleral dissection is to uh, bury the tube into the wall of the eye so that it does not cause an upward pressure on conjunctiva. A simple time uh, to go into the anti chamber. Sorry. And let's go here. And then we basically close the flap as you can see with two 10 on islands and close the conjunctiva. This is a very good way to avoid erosions. Uh, if you decide to put the flap deep into the eye behind the iris in the sulcus, this also is a technique that is associated with a reduction of <clears throat> loss of endothelial cells and of uh, less erosion. So. If you decide to go into the sulcus, you, you're probably doing the patient a great favor and doing yourself a great favor. <clears throat> Here is a, a new device, the micro shunt, and we're putting it intrasclerally under the conjunctiva. And it is very important when you do it to put it under the tenon. You have to search for the tenon. Go find the tenon. Because if you put these devices immediately under the conjunctiva, the, they will scar and the complication rate is very high. So as you see here, we are slowly and meticulously dissecting the tenon and closing the eye in two layers. We're closing the tenon first, and then we're closing the conjunctiva. You can see here, this is a patient of mine that the, the fellow came and said, it looks fantastic. The pressure is eight, wonderful. And then... I asked him to do a, a, a sidle test because eight after th three years, I was a bit, uh, you know, uncomfortable with the figure. You have to always doubt the results. And if you see a little bit of sidle here and you can see a little bit of fluorescein and you can see that the, that the micro shunt, the presser flow has actually perforated the conjunctiva and, and came out and did. that's why it's actually filtering to open sky. That's why in a case like that, you have a great pressure. This needed, of course, to be taken into the operating theater. And you cannot just co correct something like that simply. You have to make sure that it is under the tenon and you have to put a tutoplast on top of the micro shunt to prevent further uh, perforation. Now, the drug companies nowadays are uh, very much in trouble with no big new molecules in the pipeline. So they're all queuing to introduce new procedures. One of those procedures that are interesting 
is this procedure, which is the um, hydrus implant. I have been part of the original study for hydrus. I think that must be 10 years ago when we have uh, in, injected a big number of cases in Geneva. As you can see here, we're putting that as a scaffold into the, uh, in, into the um, uh, Schlems canal, opening Schlems canal. And there are some sort, if I go back here, you can see that there are small eyelets that I can also do a gonio-puncture in to increase the flow if the implant itself is not enough. But the nice thing about those devices is that this is absolutely bleb, blebless surgery and it's totally conjunctiva independent. Another procedure that is supracoroidal now is the eye stand supra. And as you can see, we can inject that in the supracoroidal space. This has a study that has been ongoing for a long while. We still haven't yet the results. I've put some, but not within a study. And uh, my results were a mixed bag. Some cases went very well. Some cases didn't work at all. <clears throat> and uh, the last kid on the block is what you see here is the mini eject uh, implant. And maybe surgically, you can see even we, we are putting it through an injector into the supracoroidal space. It's quite a big implant that goes into the supracoroidal space. And now we withdraw the device. You will see that in a second. And the implant remains in place. You can see that here. So it, it remains in place. Now, all those devices have issues with the potential for endothelial cells. And we have published Mark Sherwood, Franz Gren, and I uh, a, a book many years ago on the guidelines on how to design and how to report glaucoma surgical trials. And it's a, basically a cookbook on how to uh, allow us, which would allow us to all speak the same language. And it is freely downloadable from the World Glaucoma Association uh, website. It's a PDF of about 100 page. I would strongly recommend that you take a look if you are interested <clears throat> to design, to report, or to read a glaucoma surgical trial. So glaucoma surgery is a lot of, uh, how can I say that? It's glorified plumbing. And uh, we need to create our own knowledge wish list. The International Society of Glaucoma Surgery <clears throat> where I'm acting at this point of time as its president, uh, has created a list of uh, projects that we think are worthwhile. And this, I think, is going to be uh, a very interesting endeavor where we are going to uh, send that to uh, all glaucoma surgeons around the world to try the, to, try to convince them to uh, answer some questions that we, as a society, think are very pertinent. We will try to help with funding, and uh, the idea is to really create real studies that would add uh, knowledge that can create paradigm shift. We have uh, a lot of interest in cost effectiveness and patient satisfaction. Uh, it is Daid, and I want to say Aid Saeed, and I want to tell you that it is always very important not to take ourselves too seriously. This is a very interesting photo that I would like to show you from the library of the Geneva University Hospitals. This is uh, uh, Professor Fagioni, one of the, our professors in Geneva many years ago. This is, uh, if you can believe it, is Sir Stuart Duke Elder. Uh, anybody who's anybody in ophthalmology knows who Stuart Duke Elder and have seen and worked from his books. And the last is also another giant in the field, Professor Jules Francois from Belgium. Uh, the three of them were very big. And uh, here you can see in one of the meetings that was organized in Geneva, they're taking themselves not too serious. They're having fun. And I think we all should, we all owe it to ourselves in the AI to have fun. So thank you very much for those who have attended today, uh, who have taken time from El Aid to be with us. I hope this was, this was a very concentrated talk on the necessity to respect conjunctiva. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tariq, for uh, the idea. This is an idea, uh, which is a gift that we give to uh, uh, our beloved ones in Eid. <laughs> so uh, you have given us uh, the, the idea uh, tonight. And um, 
uh, really it's uh, an enjoyable um, uh, night. Thank you uh, with this very nice and interesting talk. Uh, so uh, uh, I will leave now the discussion to Dr. Uh, uh, Ahmed Mustafa, but you have to show us your face. Otherwise, we will not allow you to talk. And uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not having uh, the new words for El Eid, but uh, anyway, it's a very uh, happy moment that I didn't like to miss it, uh, to meet all of you at the beginning of El Eid, because uh, I think that will be a cause of uh, extra happiness uh, on this uh, very holy occasion. Uh, Tariq, thank you very much for this uh, very nice lecture as usual. Um, you know that I just, uh, when I see uh, the leaking blebs after a deep skerectomy, uh, just uh, take me to the uh, confusion of uh, some of the colleagues that deep skerectomy doesn't work very well, but deep skerectomy is really working very well through the uh, subconjunctival space as you uh, have shown us uh, lots of uh, filtration. Uh, so that, uh, Tara, I need to ask you something that if the conjunctiva is shortened, uh, like in a case which you have nicely shown that uh, you have taken a conjunctival graft, uh, do you use as well um, a fornix release incision? Because sometimes when uh, I find the conjunctiva is shortened, I go for the fornix before I go to the inferior part to take extra conjunctiva. Have you tried? And I've, I've you tried. Have I've tried the yeah, Ahmed uh, fornix uh, release incisions, and I have tried also temporal and nasal. Hmm. Uh, and uh, if you if you are far enough away, they will they will uh, scar in a decent way, and they will not leak. So it is a very interesting way of doing it. Uh, so I sometimes do that, but in this specific case that I've showed, the the the, the what was left was uh, bare was too much, and uh, I left my conjunctiva on a lot of stretching, uh, the the initial conjunctiva on a lot a lot of stretching, so I was worried that it will, uh, you know, even even with an incision, I was worried that uh, it would break, that the stitches would break and that uh, the patient would have a, a, an exposed flap. For that reason, I chose a, a complete conjunctival uh, flap on top. Uh, and, and that is immediately from the start. Sometimes you follow your instincts. But if it is really quite small, I, I start first to massage the, the, the conjunctiva. I put a lot of, of uh, BSS, massage the flap. Sometimes I will dissect underneath it a little bit more posteriorly. And in English, we say coax. You try to coax the conjunctiva back to its place. Uh, it sometimes works. Uh, but what is very important is that you do not leave the conjunctiva closure under enormous tension because it can break. It can tear, the stitches can cheese wire. So in any case, if you cannot have a decent, good, comfortable coverage of the bleb with the conjunctiva, it's better to go do a flap. Yeah, you know, sometimes also I find when you, you just um, uh, make the, the wire, sometimes it's applying too much uh, pressure on the lids and you need to uh, release this pressure. Some, uh, as you have said, few, few, uh, you know, few tips uh, could help with uh, this situation. Sure, yeah. of course. And, of and, course. and, and that, what's the, the concentration of mitomycin? I'm, I'm, I'm using 0 0.28 milligram per milliliter for one minute. This is my standard. But if I'm in a difficult situation and uh, I'm very worried, I will go to 0 0.28 milligram for three minutes. And in impossible cases where I am extremely worried, I will go for 0 0.5 milligram for three minutes. And that is under peer pressure because I have fought against 0 0.5 milligram per milliliter for a long while. But then you somehow the state of the art among uh, key opinion leaders now has shifted to 0.5 milligram per milliliter. And there is a saying that says uh, to go with the crowd is human and to stay alone uh, and to go your own way is almost divine. So sometimes, sometimes you unfortunately are affected by, uh, by you know, 
peer pressure and you 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 bow to that and you start doing things that you are not 100% convinced of and i'm 52 the complications will happen probably in 20 years from now and i'm planning to be retired by then so uh, somebody <laughs> else can 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 manage the the bad blebs 20 years from now my my blebs that i operated in 2004 when i moved to geneva some of them are coming back and i have to manage my own blebs now but um, so uh, i mean i've never ever had more bleb constructions as the last three years hmm. before that it was it went very well 20 years down the line if you're working in the same place then they will come back and bite you yeah yeah interestingly i thought you operate uh, on people of different races so that uh, you have the opportunity to observe the the difference in conjunctival response because you are operating in, uh, in geneva at the same time i know you're operating in upper egypt Yes. So I think you have the chance to see a kind of racial response. I have. I, I, I actually, I, I tell you, this is one of God's biggest blessings. I have had the opportunity to operate, obviously, in Egypt, still do. I operate in Europe, and Geneva is multicultural, so I get people from all different races. But I also operated extensively in Congo, Zambia, Ghana. Ethiopia and South Africa. So I dealt with real sub-Saharan African eyes with severe glaucomas. And then I had the opportunity to operate in Mexico, which was a different group, but the most interesting group for me were operating in Hong Kong because I was, I, I was invited as a visiting expert in the Chinese University of Hong Kong at the time when Dennis Lam uh, was, was the chairman. And I spent a lot of time uh, operating there. And uh, I all what I learned about anger closure glaucoma was from Dennis's team. But I also worked on deep sclerectomies. I saw the conjunctivas there. To my mind, the worst conjunctivas that I've seen are Southeast, Southeast Asian conjunctivas of affluent Southeast Asian countries. So if you're talking Hong Kong, Singapore, um, uh, Bangkok, uh, Thailand, uh, you know, uh, those places are affluent. Patients are taking a lot of topical medications and they end up having very bad conjunctivas. Um, interesting enough, some of the best conjunctivas that I've dealt with were conjunctivas in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, everybody tells you African eyes and they scar, blah, 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 blah. I don't think this is true. I think that we know about African eyes from African-Americans. And African-Americans, when you take them to the operating theater, on average, they would have been treated with medical therapy for eight years on. While in Africa, you take an Ethiopian or a Congolese eye, you diagnose glaucoma, and you take them immediately to the operating theater. Fantastic conjunctivus. You know, I operated patients, and I come years back and see the patients that I operated beautifully functioning trabeclectomies and deep sclerectomies with clean conjunctivas, uh, no scarring, uh, surviving blebs. <clears throat> so I think race is, a, is, a, is an issue, but more important than race is how much, uh, how many years of bombardment with anti-glaucoma medications and how much benzalconium chloride we have given and how much prostaglandins and beta blockers also. I mean, anything that we put on the eye is causing a degree of chronic low-grade uh, inflammation. So that's why, because the eyes are inflamed, you put a, a knife there, you cut something, and then the response is huma humongous. So before we think of ethnicity, and I agree that ethnicity is important, as you mentioned, we have to discuss uh, uh, eye drops. And if between you and I, if a patient in front of you is destined you, you, you have your experience. If the patient in front of you is probably destined for the operating theater, better take him early rather than late. Interesting. Thank you Tari, very much. I think Dr. Munir uh, uh, with us might have... Uh... Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, thank you very much, Prof. Tari. It was fantastic as usual. As usual. Right? As usual, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> always. It's always a pleasure to listen no, to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. I, I honestly, I learned a lot uh, as usual. So just a couple of things, actually. You mentioned two interesting points about 
when you take the graft, uh, and if you decide to take free corneal graft rather than uh, graft with the, um, uh, with the, you know, um, um, patched, yes. Yeah. So in these cases, do you stitch the area above the tenon when you I, take the graft? I, or I, leave I, it? I don't. I approximate the the ends of the of the tenon and conjunctiva. I, you cannot really close it completely, but you approximate it, and the, and creating the stitches will create bridges on which sort of a scaffold in which the fibroblasts will work faster to create don't, from again a conjunct covering. So I do not close it completely, but I, I approximate them together. I, I Instead of uh, giving leaving four millimeters, I would rather leave one and a half millimeters. Perfect. And uh, the, the prisoner flow, um, it's something, it's just like personal observation. I started doing prisoner flow about one and a half year ago. And for the first almost 20 cases, I was not stitching the prisoner flow on the sclera. I was leaving it as guided by the manufacturer, just uh, free under the, uh, the tenon. And then I did some kind of study like OCT, anterior segment OCT, to show that after the almost six months or so, the preserve flow, most of the time, it, become, uh, it became slightly stuck upwards, actually, and kind of touching the tenon. And in many cases, it can, I'm not sure if it can fail because of that, but it's not like on the sclera itself. So for the last almost about 30 cases, I started stitching it on the sclera. And the, the, the thing which I found very interesting, especially if you have very um, um, thin conj uh, for the patient who has been using the drops for many, many years, uh, stitching it is much safer because there is no risk of uh, uh, exposure. I think the main risk of exposure, it happened in two cases out of the initial cases where patient had very thin conj one of them did not expose, but you can tell it's kind of protruding yeah. and touching. Yeah. It will expose at some stage. Uh, so do you agree on that? Do you agree on stitching it on I the think, spare? I think it's a brilliant idea. And I heard you say that a couple of, uh, of months ago. I think you mentioned that to me a couple of months ago. And ever since I have been doing the stitch, I don't have a, a long follow-up, but I am having a specific group of those patients that I'm following, up, following them up with one of my fellows closely and trying to see if, if our results will improve. If, if after a year or so we get decent results, then maybe you and I, we should uh, start a, a multicentric trial, a randomized control trial, because you know, pressure flow is probably the most promising among all the mix that are available. And if we can tweak it a little bit to get better results, why not? Perfect. And last thing, you use the round lead needle all the time, even for the trap to close the conge? I don't touch the conge with a spatulated needle. If I touch it with a spatulated needle, it means that I have done something wrong. But my, uh, my scrub nurses know very well that on the table, there are two different ampoules of 8O vital one for the corneal stitch to be able to, uh, to actually you know, uh, attach the cornea to the speculum and the other one, which is a spatulated, the other one is round and it is used to close the conjunctiva. And even if I have to travel and operate anywhere, uh, I would always take with me two things that I do, would never forget. One is my speculum because I'm unfortunately addicted to it. And the second is that 8-0 uh, round needle because you don't always find it everywhere. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I see now everybody is quiet. <laughs> yeah, we had, a, we had a very interesting discussion. I'm very um, indebted to Ahmad and to Munir to have, uh, you know, donated this time to be with me uh, in, in this uh, course. Uh, Professor, Professor Mazen is, is our, uh, you know, uh, champion. So we, we stopped thanking him probably now because we don't know what to thank for and what not to thank for. I mean, he's, well, otherwise we'll be thanking all the time. So, um, so I, 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 really, I really enjoy today being with you. And uh, this, despite that we discussed science, uh, seeing your uh, friendly uh, and uh, dear faces uh, is a very beautiful start for the Aid for me. 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Tarek, for your kind um, words. Actually, I am like a gift in a party. So, uh, <laughs> so I was just uh, uh, watching your your mouse's talking, and then when you stop talking, then uh, ah, okay, I'm aware that uh, the discussion has finished because <laughs> I understand nothing. <laughs> I I doubt that. I strongly doubt that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I am the one, you, Dr. Mazen. It's a busy day for you. I think. The start yes. of the day was, uh, was very much related to you. Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, with uh, Susan Jacob, uh, it was very nice uh, uh, lecture from her, as well about the CARES and um, the keratoconus management, which is my field, of course. Uh, really, I am the one who owe you for your time, all of you, uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, Dr. Munir, Dr. Tariq, okay. and for the science you are you are giving to everyone and. I ask God to accept uh, all what, what you are doing and to, um, inshallah, reward you uh, in dunya and akhirah, inshallah. And uh, happy, well, inshallah. happy Eid for all. And it was really an Eid uh, tonight. Uh, I'm very happy with it. And hope to see you all soon in uh, more sessions in the future, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.